It was extremely frustrating last week when Microsoft forced an update on my computer during the middle of the HBR Talk livestream. You didn't get to hear my immediate reaction because my entire system simply stopped working during that interruption. Nothing was broadcast as I referred to the company's creator as the paratrophic, residue-consuming, incestuous offspring of a canine female and a party of unknown identity, of course in much more direct terms. On Microsoft's side of the argument, there must have been something the company thought the user just wasn't qualified to put off until a more convenient time for that update. So they had to override my preference settings and take responsibility for the welfare of my system. I'm sure they were only acting in my best interests, and I only thought I was interested in having an uninterrupted stream, of course. And then it struck me how very much like the behavior in the video we had been watching, that invasion of my computer really was. This bovine excrement is exactly what we're looking at in feminist rhetoric. A forced update. HBR Talk with Hannah Wallen. Oh, it's not the kind that will protect you from any viruses or make you more capable of doing your job. It won't provide you with any additional security, either. No, the update contained in feminist rhetoric is intended to give you a slick, or maybe sick, new interface that will make you much easier to use. It's the feminist version of China's effort to update its young men in order to make them more suitable to be exploited as their dear leader intends. The communists have decided soy boys don't make good, unquestioningly obedient soldiers. They must be more stoic, more rugged, and less open to feelings of self-interest or personal guilt. If one wants to exploit men as military cannon fodder, one must coercively hyper-masculinize them. China isn't the only nation to be guilty of such exploitation, just the one that has made the news for having articulated its utilitarian standards and their military goals. In stark contrast, while the generals of the gender war also steer young men away from self-interest, they want them to be consumed by feelings of guilt, women worship, and oddly, self-absorption. If you don't feel indebted to women, and you don't shape your entire self-image around women's opinions of you, you're useless to your feminist overlords because they can't use claims about women's interests to mobilize or otherwise manipulate you. If one wants to exploit men as social justice cannon fodder, one must coercively feminize or gynocentrize them. Either way, exploiting men as cannon fodder requires that the exploiter must define good masculinity not as a form of adult maturity, but as a manifestation of utility, either to the state or to the arbiters of women's welfare. The other common denominator? You cannot make your own decisions about masculinity, maturity, and which of the men who became adults before you should be admired and emulated. You know the drill. These people cannot take care of themselves. This time, you are these people. You're the burden of your betters, and it's their job to make your decisions for you lest you and your toxicity fail to man properly and end up offending the women. Think I'm being too hard on feminists? Consider the lecture so far. COVID strikes and men keep working because utilities don't run themselves. Women most affected by layoffs. Most layoffs are women, don't you know? Because so many women work under the table. But what if you get laid off? Women most affected, working well, laid off men, lays at home with the kids. Most essential workers are women, don't you know, because only retail and caregiving jobs count. If you ignore the kinds of home maintenance that are more likely to be done by men, men appear to do far less housework than women. Such toxic, chauvinistic masculinity. To think that carrying out 200 pounds of trash could equal putting a load of dishes into the dishwasher and then having buttons to push. What in the world is wrong with you? Why, everything about men is defective, harmful to women, and detrimental to society, but when they're suffering during the COVID crisis, they should feel important and valued enough to seek help, via feminist-approved channels, of course. You're a misogynist if you don't, because reasons. Also, if you commit suicide, women most affected by your death. 
And certainly if the popular mode of addressing stress, trauma, depression, and anxiety does not suit the needs of men suffering these conditions, that doesn't indicate that professionals who treat them need to update their methods to accommodate men. No, we must update affected men to accommodate feminist preferred treatment methods, of course. These ideologues only find men's issues worth talking about if they can exploit the topic for political power and use it to manipulate men. Rather than discussing how to free men from conditions that are a detriment to their welfare, they view men's vulnerabilities as excuses to browbeat men into submitting to feminist control. In light of that, as we continue to brave the onslaught of feminist rhetoric for another 12 minutes or so of that pseudo-academic lecture, I have only one question for the listener. Have you had enough? This week, Deborah Pani again joins HBR Talk as we continue to examine the report Masculinities and COVID-19 published by Promundo Global and Durham University. The discussion streams on multiple platforms. You can tune in Thursday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern or find other viewing and listening options for that time or later on HoneyBadgerBrigade.com.